So the uh, subject uh, for this uh, Mech Minute, uh, the February Mech Minute, is uh, the novel coronavirus, uh, coronavirus infection, uh, currently uh, called uh, COVID-19. We need to talk about why we're having this discussion. Well, this is a new type of coronavirus infection uh, that uh, four months ago was unknown and uh, now has become a global healthcare concern. It's not yet considered a pandemic, but there's no doubt that it is an epidemic problem in uh, parts of China. Uh, the majority of the cases are in China, however, it has made its way to the U.S., it's made its way to other uh, countries, and um, many of the countries with the largest uh, degree of outbreak uh, are fairly sophisticated from the perspective of medical care and health care in general. Uh, we all need to have an increased awareness uh, of this disease in order to avoid uh, widespread dissemination within the United States. Um, and the spread of this disease can be uh, limited uh, by following some simple infection control procedures that we'll discuss. I think we also need to uh, point out from the beginning uh, that influenza and other common infectious diseases in the United States currently represent a much greater threat to you as a health care provider or any uh, citizen or resident of the country uh, than this COVID-19 infection. That doesn't mean we should ignore it. I just think we need to keep things in perspective. Um, but we also have to keep that heightened sense of awareness for patients who uh, may be at risk for this disease uh, because they can serve as uh, important sources of infection of others. What I've got here is a dashboard that's been uh, put out by uh, John Hopkins University. It's updated uh, daily, if not more often than that. And what I've got here is a snapshot of uh, the screen from this morning. So it is updated frequently. And as of this morning, and today is the 25th of February, uh, there's about uh, 80,289 confirmed cases. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of them are in uh, mainland China. But there's a significant number of cases in South Korea, which is not that far away. And the other part I'd like to point out is uh, Italy is uh, fourth on the list in terms of uh, number of reported cases. Uh, Italy is a uh, sophisticated country, has a good health care system, and it's far removed from uh, China, but they're uh, fourth on the list in terms of uh, locations of infections. And uh, to my understanding, uh, to my best knowledge, they are yet to figure it out how it even got into uh, that country. So I make this point just to emphasize that while other diseases uh, may currently represent a greater risk to you, me, and other members of the healthcare organization as well as the public at large, we, we still need to be aware of this and, and I've uh, screened patients for high risk situations that may uh, put them at risk to have this illness. I do have to point out some caveats as part of this conversation. Uh, this is a, a new disease. Uh, in China, it's an epidemic. It's in evolution and changes about our knowledge chain are, are almost occurring daily. So uh, what we don't know today, we may know tomorrow. What we know today may change with time. We really don't know how deadly this disease is. Um, you know, the outbreak was identified because the more severely ill patients became the case reports that led to the initial data, the initial uh, uh, rise for concern, and the healthcare response to the outbreak. But we really don't know how many infected people are out there that have minimal or no symptoms uh, and do not seek medical care. So when we talk about a mortality rate of 2 to 3 percent, that's based upon a known number or known patients with the disease. Um, the uh, mortality rate may actually drop if there's a greater population of patients who are infected but are not symptomatic or do not seek health care or do not have a diagnosis of uh, this COVID-19 infection. Uh, again, influenza, measles, other diseases are a much greater risk to you as a member of the healthcare uh, team, as well as to the residents of the United States. Uh, we've had thousands of deaths in the United States already this year from influenza. We've had no deaths in the United States from COVID-19. And the number of influenza de uh, deaths across the world greatly outnumber the number of deaths uh, this year through this new uh, coronavirus. Um, I am going to talk about uh, PPE and the PPE recommendations are going to be based on what comes out of CDC. Uh, I think when we look at these recommendations, we will consider them to be very conservative, but I think uh, a degree of uh, conservation or being having this conservative outlook is appropriate since we don't have a thorough understanding of this disease.
I think we also need to point out uh, that ES, each EMS agency uh, is just responsible for de defining the level of PPE to be used uh, by its providers. Um, so I am only going to talk about those recommendations that come through the CDC. There may be other infectious disease consultants out there who think um, that level of uh, protection is not indicated. So what is this virus? Well, uh, coronavirus uh, 2019 or COVID-19 is a respiratory illness. Uh, it's in the same family of viruses that causes uh, mild upper respiratory infections, but it's also the same family of viruses that causes SARS and MERS, uh, both of which are uh, important infectious diseases from years past. Um, most likely this disease came from an animal reservoir, uh, but that's really yet to be fully proven. Uh, symptoms can be very mild or it can become severe and result in death. Uh, currently, the mortality rate is between 2 to 3 percent. Just from the perspective uh, of the other coronaviruses, uh, SARS has a mortality rate of about 15 percent and MERS, the Middle East uh, Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus, has a mortality rate of around 40 percent. So uh, I think it's kind of easy to sit back and say, oh, it's just another coronavirus. That's what gives you uh, cold symptoms. You have to keep in mind that some of these coronaviruses have fatality rates of up to 40%. So we have to uh, be conservative in how we approach this disease. It also appears that this is, uh, disease um, more severely affects uh, adults than children. Uh, and uh, really, there have been relatively few cases of patients uh, with disease identified that are children. And uh, the mortality rate is particularly high in uh, patients uh, over 50 or 60 years of age. And uh, it is particularly um, severe in patients who are over age 70 or have underlying chronic illness. Um, it's thought that the spread is primarily through person-to-person -person, uh, transmission by droplets. Uh, it, although there is um, some concern that it could be uh, transmitted by uh, contact with infected surfaces or infected items like uh, infected silverware, uh, drinking cups, and so on. It seems to spread very easily, uh, and um, uh, it, it seems to have an incubation period of between 2 and 14 days. Uh, there's been some uh, literature in the past week or two that suggests the incubation period may be uh, longer than that. I think an important consideration is that uh, patients can be infectious for days before they become symptomatic. So if the uh, patient develops clinical illness eight days after exposure for the, a couple days before they have clinical symptoms may actually be an inf uh, a, uh, infectious disease risk or source of infection to other people uh, in the general population. So what kind of symptoms uh, are associated with this infection? Well, there. You know, many of the symptoms are nonspecific, similar to what you would experience for cold or flu. And those things are fever, cough, shortness of breath. Uh, the more severe cases uh, tend to be uh, pneumonia, um, and a reasonable number of the patients with severe complications develop, develop uh, uh, ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome, and require ventilatory support. So currently, we make the diagnosis based on the clinical features and um, their epidemiologic risk. In other words, uh, does a patient have fever or symptoms of a lower respiratory infection such as cough or dyspnea and have uh, any source of contact uh, with a patient who has uh, been confirmed to have this new infection? Um, or have they developed symptoms uh, with fever and cough and a history of recent travel to um, the endemic area of China within the previous 14 days? I think this, this uh, may change. So if a patient come, has been in Korea or South Korea and developed symptoms, uh, should they be given the same consideration uh, as patients who have recently been in China? Uh, I think that that will change, and I think the answer will eventually be yes. Um, or any patient who's w been in China within the previous 14 days and having symptoms of cough and shortness of breath. So really at this point, uh, it's diagnosed based on travel history and symptoms. Uh, we can do uh, laboratory testing for it. Uh, initially, all of the testing for this disease was through the CDC, so samples had to be obtained and um, 
then sent down to CDC. The CDC has since uh, started to push the technology out to the Ohio or to the uh, state departments of health. Um, but before these departments of health could start testing, uh, they have to meet certain proficiency uh, standards and requirements by the CDC. Uh, I know Ohio Department of Health is working on it, but I, at this point, I do not know if they've been approved to do the testing in-house by the CDC or not. Uh, so uh, that's something that has to be uh, determined at the time we obtain the samples. Uh, I think it's important uh, to understand that this new virus is considered a class A disease uh, in terms of its reporting to the health department, which means it has to be immediately reported to the health department. Uh, this past weekend, I recently had a 50-some-year-old uh, gentleman who uh, is uh, Chinese by origin but uh, lives in the United States. He's traveled to China twice since December. Uh, his, he returned last at the end of uh, January, and then he self-quarantined for two weeks. Um, last week, he developed some symptoms of upper respiratory infection, came to the emergency department. Turns out he had uh, influenza A um, and was not considered high, to be highly suspect for this disease, but I was obligated to report it to the health department and eventually uh, talked to somebody at the health department who communicated with the Ohio Department of Health and it was that point determined that we were not going to isolate the patient or test him any further. So we have to have that high index of suspicion. So what are the complications of this disease? What's so bad about it? Well, the symptoms vary from being mild or if not asymptomatic to fatal illness. Again, the mortality rate seems to be close to 3%. Uh, it, it seems also that patients have the um, propensity to deteriorate during the second week of the illness. So uh, the patients can actually clinically improve a little bit that first week and then they get sick again. They kind of hit the edge of the cliff and fall off. Uh, uh, anywhere from 17 to 29 percent of patients who are hospitalized for this disease develop ARDS. Uh, about 10 percent develop pneumonia, of which about a third require ICU care for the pneumonia and for respiratory support. So uh, the potential for complications is significant and um, they, they can result to significant morbidity if, if not mortality. So I think our focus should really be on suspicion and prevention. Uh, how do we prevent the spread of this virus? Well, I think the first thing is we avoid patients uh, who are sick. Well, we're healthcare providers. Patients call us or come to see us because they're sick. So uh, avoidance behavior really won't work well for us. Uh, we should avoid touching uh, our eyes, nose, and mouth uh, with our hands. Uh, you know, I will say over and over again that hand hygiene is paramount, uh, and it's the primary concern of the CDC and others. We have to wash our hands or use hand sanitizer uh, every time we're around patients. Uh, if patient has clinical symptoms, they should stay home. Uh, I talked about the gentleman who'd been to China. He's self-quarantined. Um, so patients uh, who are ill should stay home. That's to uh, avoid exposing other members of the population to the disease. If uh, patients have to cough or sneeze, they should cover their uh, uh, face and uh, nose with a Kleenex or a tissue and then throw it in the trash. Uh, those things that are used or shared by others should be regularly cleaned and disinfected. For us, that may mean we disinfect the trucks after uh, all patient contact or at least the, the uh, gurney and the uh, the surface areas of the cabinets and so on. Um, the CDC has recommendations for face mask use, which I'll discuss in a bit. Uh, the CDC does not recommend that people wear a fast face mask in general population just to protect themselves, um, even though we see a lot of that in, in uh, images and uh, videos coming out of China. And uh, patients who have symptoms of upper respiratory uh, illness and who uh, may have symptoms of COVID-19 infection should wear a face mask because that'll help uh, keep the spread of uh, droplets uh, into the community and around to others uh, when they cough and sneeze. And uh, healthcare providers also have to use face masks when around these patients. Uh, we should also, again, practice great hand hygiene, lots of soap and water for 20 minutes or 20 seconds at a time, uh, and then um, after we blow our nose, and then using hand sanitizer. Um, um, or if we can't get the soap and water. I think a point I'd like to make here is that, um, yes, this is seen as a respiratory illness, but uh, uh, if you look at some of the reports that have been published, such as in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the virus has been isolated in urine and stool, so uh, we don't know if these other body fluids may also serve as sources of infection and transmission of this uh, virus.
Ohio's EMS providers, how do we approach a patient with possible infection? Well, we have to have that high index of suspicion for a potentially infected patient. And I think this is also true of any patient who's got an acute respiratory illness. So it could be influenza, it could be a common cold. If the patient's coughing, sneezing with a lot of secretions, protect yourself, put a mask on the patient, prevent spread of this illness, whether it's COVID-19 or a common uh, virus or influenza. We have worked with our 911 call centers to ask, uh, make inquiries. So for the general illness uh, calls, um, they're asking, has, does the patient have a history of travel to mainland China within the past 14 days? Or uh, did the patient have close contact with a patient uh, diagnosed with this uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 infection within the previous 14 days? If uh, the answer is yes to either of those two questions, then we consider the patient to be potentially infected with COVID-19 and the crew should be notified so they can take appropriate action before they arrive and during patient care. So uh, those are things we keep in mind. It, it will be interesting to see if these recommendations for screening questions change with time uh, as the disease becomes more prevalent uh, uh, across, uh, across the world. And again, I'm thinking of uh, places like uh, South Korea and maybe even Italy. So from a perspective of patient assessment, what, do we should, what should we do? Well, I think once uh, we are notified by the 911 uh, call taker that the one or both of the screening questions are positive, we should uh, prepare with uh, putting on our PPE. Uh, when we get to the scene, um, we should place a mask on the patient. Uh, it would also limit the number of providers who are physically present in the room assessing the patient. Uh, if you only need two people to take care of the patient, you don't need five people in the room. Uh, and uh, minimize the number of providers who are in the patient compartment during transport as well. I think another important component is to notify the receiving hospital as soon as possible. Uh, patients who uh, are at risk or uh, may, are suspicious for having this infection need to go to a negative pressure isolation room. Uh, the emergency departments have them available, but they're not many, and they may have to move a, a current patient out of the room in order to take your patient. So uh, it's the more notice they have, the better. It usually takes five to 10 minutes to move a patient out of a room and get the uh, negative pressure room up and running uh, once the decision has been made to use it. So uh, advanced notice is, is very much needed and appreciated. Let's talk a little bit about PPE. So again, I'm using recommendations by the CDC. Um, I know there are uh, some people out there who think these recommendations are uh, unnecessarily strict and stringent, but I'm going to talk only about the CDC recommendations because from my perspective, uh, they are the highest level of authority in the United States. Uh, so for patients who are providing direct care, uh, they are recommending standard uh, contact and airborne precautions. Well, what does that mean? That means um, we put on a gown, which could be one of those plastic gowns. Uh, we put on gloves. Uh, we use an N95 uh, mask or higher, so it could be an N95, N99. It could be a PAPR. Um, you could even make an argument that a, uh, a SCBA is uh, necessary, but I wouldn't go that far. I think the SCBA is more than adequate protection. I think an N95 mask is, is uh, easily meets the standard. And then you should use eye protection, particularly if you're going to use uh, or provide any uh, airway management or any um, uh, other airway procedures, whether it's a nasal trumpet or um, intubation or whatever. So uh, protect your eyes. That could be either with goggles or a face shield. Uh, from the perspective of the uh, person driving the vehicle. Uh, the CDC currently recommends that the dr vehicle driver uh, doff all PPE except the respirator or the N95 mask, uh, leave that on. Um, use good hand hygiene after removing everything uh, and then um, take the patient to the hospital. There are also some other associated precautions, uh, like I mentioned earlier, avoiding airway procedures, such as suctioning uh, nebulized medications, applying CPAP or BiPAP, or intubating the patient. I mean, if you have to do it, you have to do it, um, but if you can avoid doing airway interventions, that would help uh, reduce the risk of uh, spread to you and other uh, members of your crew. Uh, the CDC recommends placing a HEPA filter on BVMs on the exhaust uh, valve so that when the air is exhausted, uh, it is filtered and you don't uh, 
spread any uh, aerosolized uh, virus uh, into the uh, air around the patient and, and within the um, cab. Uh, they also mentioned if possible you have to do airway procedures, uh, have the uh, doors and windows open in the cab. I realize that if the patient needs nebulized meds and needs to be ma uh, moved urgently, uh, we're not going to leave the back doors open while we drive down the road, but if there's an, if there's an ability to increase ventilation in the truck, you should take it. Uh, there's also a recommendation from CDC if you have the ability to close a window between the ca driver's cab and the patient compartment, you should do that. Uh, I think all the trucks that I've seen have an open uh, window between the, the driver's cab and the back. Um, we should circulate uh, fresh air into both the cab and the patient compartment, so uh, you know, turn the air circulator on. Uh, if it's not too cold out and the, the driver can open his window a little bit, uh, that will bring air into the cab past him and into the back. Uh, I think that's another way to help move air through the vehicle. So again, here's some other cautions. Well, how about patient handoff? So you do everything right, you get to the hospital. Uh, what are you going to do with the patient? So again, we want to notify the receiving facility as soon as possible so the facility can uh, prepare for the patient. Uh, we want to keep that patient away from the public. Um, so that may mean uh, clearing public spaces before you move the patient out. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Family members should not ride in the EMS vehicle uh, and should be given surgical masks to wear on the way to the hospital. Uh, the reason we should mask them is if they've been with the patient and if the patient truly has a COVID-19 infection, then the family members have the potential to be infected and be infectious even though they may not have symptoms. So a surgical mask uh, will help uh, spread those germs or prevent spread of those germs. Uh, we should document all of the patient care during transport. Uh, I also suggest that uh, we document uh, the use of PPE and uh, as well as uh, hand hygiene and the fact that we did hand hygiene. And I think it's also important that we document the names of EMS providers and public safety officers are present. So uh, if there is uh, confirmation the patient has this infection, then uh, we can notify uh, the EMS providers and public safety officers and they can be also counseled appropriately by infectious disease at the county health department, uh, whatever's necessary to protect their health. So document the names of every provider and every safety officer who has contact with the patient. I think that's an important component of what we do. It may add a few minutes of our, to our documentation, but I think it's everybody's best interest. How about cleaning up the vehicle? Well, uh, CDC recommends, again, that we uh, open up the doors, let the air, uh, air out, get a good air exchange. Uh, while in the vehicle, we should wear gown and gloves while cleaning the vehicle and the equipment. If there's any risk of splash, uh, for instance, if there's some body fluids that have to be cleaned up and there's a potential for it to be splashed, then we should be wearing masks and goggles. If it's basically dry surfaces, you do not need to wear masks and goggles. Uh, we should continue uh, or follow routine cleaning and, cleaning and disinfecting procedures. We should use uh, a virucidal uh, cleanser uh, or wipe uh, to wipe down the, the surfaces of the cab as well as the uh, gurney and so on uh, and allow it to adequately air dry. And then we should also use the same substance to uh, clean and disinfect all patient care equipment. So the blood pressure cuff, uh, the monitor, the, the pulse ox sensor and so on. So uh, you know, get it all uh, wiped down with a virucidal solution um, based on what, you're, what has been identified as meeting the standards by your, by your agency. So I think that covers it. I, if you need more information, I think the single best source of information is the CDC, which is cdc.gov. If you go there now on their opening page, you're going to see an immediate link uh, to the coronavirus uh, section of the web page, and it's full of good information for you. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you for listening in. Uh, be safe. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please post them on uh, Workplace. Again, thank you.